Professor Kearns, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and, and Erica as well. I really am uh, honored to be here and have an opportunity to speak with you. If you could share the slides, please. I will go through a short presentation, and then I would like to save plenty of time for your questions. Okay, if you can see the slides, you can take the control. You can see the button in the upside. Okay, okay, please. Okay, very good. So as Professor Curran said, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm sitting in Berkeley, California right now for this presentation, so it's uh, morning our time. I'm delighted to speak with you about CRISPR and the future of sustainable agriculture. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. I am not a agricultural specialist or a plant biologist, but I think as you will see, the technology of CRISPR is opening the door to extraordinary opportunities in agriculture, something that our institute is keenly interested in and I think affects all of us as we deal with the challenges of climate change and increasing global populations. On the next slide, uh, let's see, the arrows are working. There we go. I wanted to first introduce you to CRISPR. This is a technology for genome engineering. And it started for me when I began an, inter an international collaboration back in 2011 with Professor Emmanuel Charpentier, then in Umea, Sweden, and her student, Chris Chylinski in Vienna, Austria. So it's been a, a, a truly extraordinary and international partnership that led to the development of the technology that I'll describe. This is a tool that allows scientists to make precise changes to the DNA of any cell. What you see in this picture is a representation of the molecules that achieve genome editing. In green, the protein called CRISPR-Cas9. In yellow, it's RNA guide, which tells the protein where to go in the DNA. And once this protein assembles on DNA, hopefully you can see the DNA helix opening and the strands being cut. This is the fundamental chemistry of the system. But to explain how it works for genome editing, I want to show you the video on the next slide. So this is a this is a um, a representation of how CRISPR-Cas9 works in animal and plant and human cells. The protein Cas9 is able to search through all of the DNA in the cell to find a short sequence that matches the sequence of the RNA guide. Once it arrives at that position the DNA unwinds, the protein is able to introduce a double-stranded break to the DNA, and that breakage triggers repair enzymes in the cell to fix the break, and in the process, introduce a change to the DNA. There are many different ways to implement CRISPR that allow DNA to be removed, DNA to be inserted, or the actual letters of the DNA to be altered. And this provides a profound opportunity now for scientists to control the genetics of animals and plants and to make changes that help us both understand the basic functions of genes, but also increasingly to interfere with the DNA itself for medical or agricultural applications. So when we think about where this technology is headed, it was just under 10 years ago that Professor Charpentier and I published our research for the first time in 2012. Less than 10 years later, we have multiple companies that have started around the world that are working with CRISPR. We have multiple clinical trials that have already announced their exciting results. And importantly for this conversation, many agricultural companies, large and small across the world, are adopting CRISPR because they recognize that it's a powerful tool for today and for the future. 
So I wanted to briefly mention what we consider the four revolutions of plant breeding, starting with selective breeding that required a lot of time and depended on random changes to the DNA in plants to give rise to desired traits. This led to mutation breeding since the 1920s in which random changes could be introduced using radiation or other kinds of mutagens like chemicals to introduce random alterations to plant DNA followed by selection for plants with desired traits. Again, um, relatively fast compared to selective breeding, but a random process. And then since the 1980s, it's been possible to do what's called transgenic breeding. So only the desired gene or trait is incorporated, but that incorporation is random into the plant genome and that can trigger undesired properties in the plant. And now with genome editing, we have a unique opportunity to make precise changes to the DNA of plants. This process is fast and importantly, it leaves no trace. So it allows scientists to make the kinds of changes that will introduce desired traits without introducing undesirable features or alternatively losing traits that are uh, of interest. And I personally, although I'm not a plant biologist, I think that the potential impact of CRISPR on agriculture across our planet is huge. I think it has the potential to impact many more people in a shorter timeline than what we will see in medicine, for example, at least in the near term. So when we think about the opportunities with CRISPR, I want to point out that and I think everyone here is, is, is aware of this, that climate change has enormous impacts on our food system. And what I'm showing you here are just, you know, some of the ways in which the uh, changing climate across the planet is affecting the way that we grow food, the way that we distribute food. Um, we have to think about effects on globalization. And I sort of summarized on the right-hand side, the fact that there's increased uh, disease severity, um, lower yields of crops, often due to challenges of, of the changing temperature and, and the effects of that, and also lower nutritional quality of food. All of these things are immediate impacts of climate change that we're, we're grappling with, I think, across uh, the planet at present. And these impacts are not in the distant future, but again, I think we're all aware that we're seeing these impacts right now. So there are uh, changes that are affecting, for example, the growth of grapes, the, uh, the um, harvesting of olives, the, uh, the, the production of chocolate, personal favorite of mine, and of course, many other uh, crops that are being affected in different climates and um, niches across the planet. So when, when we do think about how we protect uh, small farmers, how we have protect family farms and crops that may be important regionally, I would argue that CRISPR will have an incredibly important role to play in that uh, process if it's uh, managed well, both from a scientific perspective, but also from a regulatory perspective. And Importantly, the technology is moving very quickly. I can't emphasize this enough to you. This is an extraordinary time in science. We've, we've seen already thousands of publications, it may be tens of thousands at this point, uh, using the CRISPR technology in many different systems. And a lot of that emphasis is on uh, systems that are important in agriculture, whether we're talking about plants or the microbes that support uh, agriculture in different parts of the world. We just saw a recent announcement of the first CRISPR edited food to go on sale. This is the CRISPR tomato. It has uh, supposedly increased uh, nutritional value. This is on sale now in Japan. We saw news earlier the, in the sometime in the last year about uh, CRISPR edited beer uh, made from hops that are edited using CRISPR. I've had that beer myself, in fact. And coming soon are 
crops and other agricultural products that will be um, the result of CRISPR genome editing. And some of them are listed um, on the lower part of the left-hand part of the slide. And so when we think about applications of CRISPR that will impact climate change, we have to be thoughtful about how the earth will be able to accommodate the growing population that we, that we are uh, facing. And also at the same time, thinking about how our food system is responsible for more than a third of greenhouse gas emissions. How do we grapple with this seemingly um, uh, juxtap this sort of juxtaposition of an increased population and increased greenhouse gas emissions from food production. And I think CRISPR will have a critical role to play in addressing that challenge. And finally, I want to point out that it's been clear from the very beginning with CRISPR that it has potentially huge ethical implications, not only in agriculture, of course, but also in uh, the treatment of human beings, and in particular, the potential to use CRISPR in the human germline to make heritable changes in humans. And this is not a not theoretical, it's in fact already happened and has spurred an international partnership to ensure that as much as possible, the international scientific community is aligned in the way that we pay attention to and encourage transparency of the technology as it continues to advance. And I'll be happy to say more about that in the questions if anyone uh, wants to talk about that. And then I just want to, um, importantly, I want to turn to the, um, the public perception. I think that, again, we're all aware that equally important to the science, the actual science and the technology is the way that it's perceived by the public. So I think we all have a responsibility to ensure accurate information that is relayed to the public. Even it, when there is accurate information, of course, there can be misperceptions, whether they are incidental or, or uh, purposeful, that can can guide the, the, the public's thinking about new technologies in different ways. So I encourage all of us to take a proactive approach in the case of CRISPR. And so in conclusion, I just want to point out that CRISPR adds speed and accuracy to plant breeding without the addition of foreign genes. So it's a, a tool that allows precise changes to be made to DNA in plants. It's widely accessible. So it's not only a technology available to large corporations, but I would argue can be made available to small scale uh, farmers as well. And that will also be a, a, an important part of the way it will have global impact, in my opinion. Public acceptance is not assured and it will require careful stewardship as the technology moves forward. And of course, underlying